Even when you're feeling bad Even when you've got the flu Even when you're down and sad You can watch StatQuest StatQuest Hello, and welcome to StatQuest. StatQuest is brought to you by the friendly folks in the genetics department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, we're going to do an introduction to RNA-seq. We'll start out with a bunch of normal neural cells and a bunch of mutated neural cells. These guys are abnormal. The mutated cells behave differently than the normal cells. We want to know what genetic mechanism is causing the difference. This means we want to look at differences in gene expression. So let's figure out a way to do this. Each cell has a bunch of chromosomes, and each chromosome has a bunch of genes, and some of the genes are active. These wavy lines represent messenger RNA transcripts, but this gene is not active. High throughput sequencing tells us which genes are active and how much they are transcribed. This is super important, so I'm going to say it again. High throughput sequencing tells us which genes are active and how much they are transcribed. We can use RNA-seq to measure gene expression in normal cells, and then use it to measure gene expression in mutated cells. Then we can compare the two cell types and figure out what's different in the mutated cells. For gene 1, there's no difference between normal and mutated cells. For gene 2, we see a big difference between normal and mutated cells. And for gene 3, we see a subtle difference between normal and mutated cells. There are three main steps for RNA-seq. One, prepare a sequencing library. Two, sequence. And three, data analysis. Let's start with preparing an RNA-seq library. Note, I'm using the Illumina protocol and sequencer as my example because they are commonly used. But keep in mind there are other protocols and sequencers that do it differently. Step one, isolate the RNA. Step two, break the RNA into small fragments. We do this because RNA transcripts can be thousands of bases long but the sequencing machine can only sequence short 200 to 300 base pair fragments. Step three, convert the RNA fragments into double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is more stable than RNA and can be easily amplified and modified. This leads us to the next step. Step four, add sequencing adapters. The adapters do two things. One, they allow the sequencing machine to recognize the fragments. Two, they allow you to sequence different samples at the same time, since different samples can use different adapters. This helps you save time and money. Notice that this step doesn't work 100% of the time. There are a couple of DNA fragments that didn't get sequencing adapters. In step five, we PCR amplify the library. Only the fragments with sequencing adapters are amplified. They are enriched. Step six is quality control. You verify the library concentration, and you also verify the library fragment lengths to make sure they're not too long or too short. Hooray! Now we sequence the library. Let's see how this is done. Imagine this is a fragment of DNA we want to sequence. It's vertical, because that's how it is inside the sequencer. Actually, there are about 400 million fragments laid out vertically in a grid. I'm just showing you four fragments so your brain doesn't explode. This grid is called a flow cell. The machine has fluorescent probes that are color-coded according to the type of nucleotide they can bind to. The probes are attached to the first base in each sequence. Once the probes have attached, the machine takes a picture of the flow cell from above that looks like this. 
The picture tells the machine that the first base in the bottom left-hand corner is an A. This base is a G, and these two bases are C. Then the machine washes the color off the probes. Then the probes are bound to the next base in each fragment. The machine takes a picture from above, and now it knows that this base is C, this base is G, and these two bases are T. Then the machine washes the color off the probes, and the process repeats until the machine has determined each sequence of nucleotides. This is how it works with four DNA fragments. With 400 million DNA fragments, the matrix is much denser. This matrix still isn't 400 million DNA fragments, but it illustrates one type of problem that can occur. Sometimes a probe will not shine as bright as it should, and the machine isn't super confident that it is calling the correct color. Quality scores that are part of the output reflect how confident the machine is that it correctly called a base. In this case, the faded dot would get a low quality score. Another reason you might get a low quality score is when there are lots of probes the same color in the same region. This is called low diversity, and the overabundance of a single color can make it hard to identify the individual sequences. The colors will blur together. Low diversity is especially a problem when the first few nucleotides are sequenced, because that is when the machine determines where the DNA fragments are located on the grid. Now that we've seen how the machine works, let's take a look at the raw data. Each sequencing read consists of four lines of data. The first line, which always start with an at symbol, is a unique ID for the sequence that follows. The second line contains the bases called for the sequenced fragment. The third line is always a plus character. I have no idea why. I asked the internet, and I don't think it knows either. The fourth line contains quality scores for each base in the sequenced fragment. A typical sequence run with 400 million reads will generate a file containing 1.6 billion lines of data. Now that we understand the raw data and how it's generated, we need to filter out garbage reads, align the high quality reads to a genome, and count the number of reads per gene. So let's talk about how to filter out garbage reads. Garbage reads are 1. reads with low quality base calls and 2. reads that are clearly artifacts of the chemistry. We've already talked about low quality base calls, so now let's talk about artifacts from the chemistry. A typical read is a DNA fragment plus adapter sequences but sometimes the adapters just bind to each other and the read is just adapter sequence. This is a garbage read. Now we need to align the reads to a genome. We start with the genome and the genome sequence. We then split it into small fragments for reasons that will be explained in a little bit. We then create an index of all the fragments and their locations within the genome. Now we have a sequenced read. Just like with the genome, we split the read into fragments. We then match the read fragments to the genome fragments. The genome fragments that matched the read fragments will determine a location, chromosome and position, in the genome. Why are we breaking the sequences up into small fragments? This allows us to align reads even if they are not exact matches to the reference genome. Imagine this base wasn't in the reference genome because, for example, my genome is slightly different from yours. Then this fragment won't match anything in the index, but the other fragments will, and we will still be able to figure out where the read came from. Next, we have to count the reads per gene. Once we know the chromosome and position for a read, 
we can see if it falls within the coordinates of a gene or some other interesting feature. Here are two genes and their coordinates within the genome. We have this information for all 20,000 genes in the genome. After you count the reads per gene, you end up with a matrix of numbers like this. The first column contains gene names. The human genome has about 20,000 genes, so this matrix has about 20,000 rows. We're just looking at the first few. The remaining columns contain counts for each sample you sequenced. There are usually between 6 and 800 plus samples. Bulk RNA sequencing, where a sample is the average of a pool of cells, usually 6 million cells, might have 3 normal samples and 3 disease state samples, or a total of 6. Bulk RNA sequencing is the more common method used these days. It was the original method. Single cell RNA-seq treats each cell like an individual sample, so it can generate a lot of samples. Each row gives counts per sample for a specific gene. If this were a single cell RNA-seq experiment, we would have 20,000 rows, genes, by 800 plus columns, samples, giving us at least 16 million values to keep track of. That's a huge matrix and it's only going to get bigger since sequencing gets cheaper and people are doing more and more samples. The last thing we do before analysis is normalize the data. This is because each sample will have a different number of reads assigned to it due to the fact that one sample might have more low quality reads or another sample might have a slightly higher concentration on the flow cell. Here's an example. Sample 1 has a total of 635 reads assigned to it. Sample 2 has 1,270 reads assigned to it, twice as many reads as sample number 1. This does not mean that the genes in sample number 2 were all transcribed twice as much as in sample number 1. Instead, it means that sample number 2 had fewer low-quality reads and might have landed on more spots on the flow cell than sample number 1. However, the read counts make it look like the genes in sample number 2 were transcribed twice as much as in sample number 1. So we need to adjust the read counts per gene to reflect the differences in how many reads were assigned to each sample. The simplest method is to just divide the read counts per gene by the total mapped to each sample. However, there are many more sophisticated ways to do this. For more details, check out the videos in my High Throughput Sequencing playlist. We started out with a bunch of normal neural cells and a bunch of mutated neural cells. Then we extracted the messenger RNA. Then we sequenced, aligned, counted the reads per gene in each sample, and normalized. Now it's time to analyze the data. Step one in any analysis is always the same. Plot the data. Remember, the data is a huge matrix. If there were only two genes, then plotting the data would be easy. First, we'd replace the gene names with X and Y and then just plot the samples on an XY graph. Sample number one would go at X equals 30 and Y equals 24. Sample number two would go at X equals five and Y equals 10. And sample number three would go at X equals 13 and Y equals 18. But we have 20,000 genes. So we would need a graph with 20,000 axes to plot the raw data. So we use PCA, Principal Component Analysis, or something like it to plot this data. PCA reduces the number of axes you need to display the important aspects of the data. This is a PCA plot from a real RNA-seq experiment done on neural cells. The WT samples are normal. The KO samples are samples that were mutated by the researchers. The KO samples make a nice little cluster in the corner. 
The WT samples are all on the left side, but spread out on the y-axis. The way these graphs are drawn, the most important differences are on the x-axis. Differences along the y-axis are not as important. This means that the biggest differences are between the WT samples and the KO samples. However, when we do further analyses, we may wish to exclude WT2. Excessive self-promotion. If you want to learn more about how PCA does what it does, check out StatQuest, Principal Component Analysis, PCA, Clearly Explained. This is a single-cell RNA-seq PCA plot from neural cells. The colors were added based on what we know about the cells. The green cells were stationary, and the orange cells moved around the petri dish. Most of the orange cells are separated from the green cells. However, there are a few orange cells that seem more like the green cells. If we want to determine what is different between these cells and these cells, we might exclude these cells from the analysis. In summary, plotting the data, one, tells us if we can expect to find interesting differences, and two, tells us if we should exclude some samples from any downstream analysis. Now we're ready for step two in our analysis. Identify differentially expressed genes between the normal and mutant samples. This is typically done using R, a programming language, with either Edge R or DESeq2, and the results are generally displayed using this sort of graph. A red dot is a gene that is different between normal and mutant samples. Black dots are genes that are the same. The x-axis tells you how much each gene is transcribed. CPM stands for counts per million and is a type of normalization. Genes on the left side are lowly transcribed and genes on the right side are highly transcribed. The y-axis tells you how big the relative difference is between normal and mutant. Log FC equals the log of the fold change between the two sample types. We've identified interesting genes. Now what? If you know what you're looking for, you can see if the experiment validated your hypothesis. If you don't know what you're looking for, you can see if certain pathways are enriched in either the normal or mutant gene sets. And then what? Check out the other videos on StatQuest. You'll find complete tutorials on all kinds of stuff related to RNA-seq. PCA, heat maps, p-values, false discovery rates, etc. All kinds of stuff. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more of them, please subscribe. And if you have any suggestions for a subject you'd like to see a StatQuest on, post it in the comments below. Alright, tune in next time for another exciting StatQuest.